We've got a few announcements to draw your attention to in the bulletin. Next, uh, May April 10th, is our regularly scheduled administrative board meeting, but it's also going to include the audit. So we're actually going to start with the audit at 4 o'clock, and then as soon as that's done, we'll roll right to the regular board meeting. So if you are a part of the board, then we ask that you please be there for the whole thing. And if you are anyone that holds financial records for any of the ministries here, please have them to us at the audit. April 13th is the blood drive. Uh, from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. April 15th is our Good Friday service, uh, right here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll have the sunrise service with White Hill and Ephesus at 7 o'clock in the morning. White Hill will be uh, hosting. There will not be a breakfast to follow. So again, no breakfast on Easter morning. And then we are not doing our 9 o'clock service, so only the 11 o'clock service on Easter morning. Uh, other things to draw your attention to, our UMW is collecting the names of graduates and babies uh, that can be recognized on our Children's Day Sunday on June 5th, and UMW will also not meet in April. Uh, one announcement I was asked to make that's not in the bulletin, our flowers this morning are given to glory of God and in honor of those who uh, work diligently to keep up and beautify the grounds around here at the center, especially the flower beds that are out there. We've got some great volunteers that have nothing better to do than make sure that everything looks nice around here. They do a great job. Are there any other announcements this morning? Well, let us quiet our hearts and our minds as we enter into this time of worship, centering ourselves on Christ as Ralph leads us with all.
morning to Psalm 126. We pray this responsibly. I will lead with a ring in your print. I see the will respond together with a bold print. Number 847, Psalm 126. <clears throat> when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we are like those who dream. Then our mouth is filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those be so in tears, breathe with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bury the seed for sowing. Shout out home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Amen. Please be seated. What are you thankful for this morning? Thankful to be here. Amen. Thankful for the weather. Thankful for the blue azaleas out. The walk away right here is a beautiful out there. Thankful for being in the house of the Lord and being among our church. Amen. Amen. Yes, all right. Let's see. What needs our prayers this week? I ask that you uh, continue to keep my uncle in your prayer uh, as he is still uh, going through his last days. And there's, there's no telling how long it's going to be. Man, it just keeps sticking around. I'm glad that he does. What else needs our prayers? Yes. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. As always, I will lead us in this prayer, and I invite you to pray along with me during the time of quiet to let allow me to make several points. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have given to us. For getting us up this morning and bringing us, bringing us together in this place, for gathering your people in your spirit and in your power. For the myriad blessings that we find in our lives, blessings that are so numerous we often overlook them and take them for granted. For clean air to breathe and clean water to drink, for food to eat and keep our bodies healthy and satisfied. And for our family and our friends. For so much that you have given to us. We have not deserved any of it. Lord, we have broken the trust that you have had in us, and we have broken your commandments. We have done evil, and we have called it good. We have sinned against you and against one another. So as we come before you now in thankfulness and in humility, we confess our sins to you, praying that you will forgive praying that you will make us whole. Your grace may raise us up in righteousness to go and sin no more. We pray for this church, for the ministries that are done here. We pray for all of your churches, that all of your people may work together hand in hand for your glory and your kingdom's sake. We pray for all those who know you. We pray for all those who do not know you. We pray for those who are in danger this day, that you will shelter them under your wings and keep them safe. We pray for those who are hurting, for the physically ill, those facing surgeries and treatments, those in recovery, those who are not likely to recover. We pray for the mentally ill, for the depressed and the anxious, the scared, the addicted, and so many others. We pray for those who are brokenhearted, those who grieve, those who are filled with sorrow, those who are alone, isolated, and lonely. Lord, we ask that you heal bodies, minds, and hearts. We ask that you heal our relationships with one another. Teach us to forgive as freely and easily as you can. Heal our homes and families, heal our friendships, heal our church and our community. Heal our state, our nation, and our world. For all in need of healing this day, we pray.
Thank you, Father, for the loving kindness that you've shown to us. The hearing our prayers and answering our prayers and making a place that we can lift our voices to you. For the loving kindness that is the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection we have not. We praise you for your generosity. We praise you for your goodness and your love. We praise you because you are worthy of all praise. When we join our voices together and pray in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I seek the power of the evil. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, I shared that I had uh, gone on Facebook right before a worship service and I had I come across a, uh, a, a live feed of the Ukrainian Methodist Church in worship. And what, what a great thing that was. Well, I happened to do it again today and noticed uh, several weeks ago when I went, the, the lady that was playing the piano, she and her husband did the music together, and I noticed that she was pregnant. And this week, they were baptizing that baby. What an amazing thing. Even in the midst of war, how that life is going on, how God has continued to bless and enrich that church, and they were once again taking communion together, and I was amazed by by how connected we are in Christ. That here we are gathering and worship again and taking communion alongside them and doing what we can to help them. I want to remind everyone that we are taking on donations for Ukraine relief efforts. And I don't know if any of that money is going to go help protect that baby, but uh, take care of other babies. I know it will. If you want to donate to our Ukrainian efforts, you can do that through the church and just mark a donation. Make it out to the church, which is the market for Ukrainian relief efforts and for Ukraine. And we'll get to them. It's amazing what the church can do when we all come together and we give to God the gifts that we have. It's an amazing thing. With that said, I invite our ushers to come forward. I encourage you to give to the ministries of Christ in this place to give out of God's abundance of your life.
from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and chastises every child whom he accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not his children. Moreover, we have human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share his holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. <laughs> Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather deep. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Praise be to God. God. Holy Spirit, speak now in ways that we will not only hear, but that we will actually listen to you, that we may live out your word in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. So I want to stand up here this morning and tell you all that I have my life completely together. <laughs> I've got my life completely together. I've got everything so regimented and organized, it's not even fun. I wake up every morning when my alarm goes off. I never hit that speech button. I pop out of bed, and so do my children. They pop out of bed without even being told. They get themselves dressed and ready for school. And then my family, we all gather around the table for a nice hot breakfast every single morning. And it's all happiness and smiles around the table as we just enjoy that family time. And when it's all over, my children, take their dishes off the table and take them over to the sink and wash them and they go and they get their backpacks and they head out the door and they get in the car. I don't even have to tell them. <laughs> and they leave for school and I go to my office and I step into my office and everything is just perfectly where it's supposed to be. Every book, every notepad, every slip of paper is right where I left, right where it's supposed to be. I never have to look at anything. When I leave in the afternoon to go get my kids from school, I leave in a perfectly clean car inside and out. <laughs> and when I get home with my children, they get out of the car, they take all of their stuff with them, and they go inside and they put their stuff away, and then they just do their homework. <laughs> After they go to bed, I have been known to stay up and watch a little bit of basketball, and I never get riled when I watch it. <laughs> I sit there and just calmly enjoy the game, and when it's over, I go to bed, and I close my eyes, and I go to sleep just like that. <laughs> and I sleep all night long, and I never wake up until it's time to get up in the morning. They stop right in the fairy tale. <laughs> and if you believe any of that, I'd like to have a conversation with you because I've got a real estate deal that you just ought to take it. <laughs> Language is an amazing thing. With words, I can convey any idea that I want to. I can tell you anything that I want you to hear. 
I can tell you exactly how organized and put together my life is, exactly how perfectly behaved my children are. I can go to as much detail about it as I want. I can tell you anything that I want you to hear. Now, when I said a minute ago that if you look into my office, it's perfectly organized, Renee started giggling because this morning she went to my office and started picking papers up off the floor. <laughs> If you look in my office, if you look in my car, if you look at my house, you will see that I am not perfectly organized and that very few things are exactly where they're supposed to be. If you follow my family through a typical morning, you will very quickly realize that we do have breakfast together as a family, but it's not necessarily a warm meal by the time we actually get to it and we're not necessarily smiling. And when they do go out the door, my kids are not carrying all their stuff with them. And when they come back in the door, they are not carrying all their stuff with them. I can tell you that they are. I can tell you how neat and tidy everything is. I can tell you that I've got my life together perfectly. But it doesn't take very much observing to know that I don't. We're continuing this uh, Lenten season of our look at Christian practices that we need to be practicing. And this week, we're going to consider witness. What does it mean to witness? Last week, we looked at testimony, and oftentimes we use those words interchangeably. Witness, testimony, we, we have this idea of it meaning to stand up front and tell someone about Jesus. But just like I said, with testimony, that's a, a short-sighted and imperfect idea of witness and what it means to be a witness. So let's, let's consider this a little bit. Let's actually consider a court. Because those words, testimony and witness, they come up in court on a very regular basis. So envision a courtroom, and one lawyer gets up, and this lawyer calls for a witness. The witness comes forward and takes a stand. Now, the witness is the person. And then that witness proceeds to tell their story. And that is their testimony. So as we said last week, your testimony is the story that you tell about God's work in your life. It is that story. You yourself are the witness. Our passage from Hebrews, the author describes us as being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, if you're reading straight through that book, you would realize that he's actually referencing what he had just finished writing about in the previous two chapters. See, chapters 10 and 11 we call this the Hall of Fame of Faith, because the author just goes through all these Old Testament figures like Abraham, Moses, David, Gideon, all these very prominent Old Testament heroes, and goes into detail about the lives of faith that they lived. And he describes them as setting this example that we are to follow. So that is the great cloud of witnesses, but I think that we can add more names to that list. It has, after all, been a few thousand years since Abraham and Moses and those other guys. I'm sure that you can add some names of people that have surrounded you as witnesses. Maybe it's parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, friends, co-workers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, neighbors, people that you have known who have been great witnesses for Christ. People that have shaped your life and shaped your faith. I want you to bring those names to mind. Just take a moment. Think about, it. Think about those people. Those people that have loved you and cared for you. Those people who have taught you about Christ. I did that this week as I was studying this passage. I thought about the people that have shaped my faith, along with folks that the author of Hebrews writes about here. And what drew my attention as I considered these great witnesses is not that they had the right perfect beliefs. And it's not that they had the right perfect teachings. And it's not that they stood up and gave the right perfect type of sermons or Sunday school. And what stood out to me is that these people, these great witnesses that have shaped my faith, 
are the ones who lived out those beliefs, who lived out those Sunday school lessons and those sermons. It was through their actions that they demonstrated Christ. We have in our modern church culture, we have reduced Christianity to a list of tenets of faith. And we think that as long as we can just check off you know, at least like 85% of those things on that list, yep, I believe this, I believe that, I believe the other, then we're Christians and we're doing fine. But what scripture tells us is that Christianity is not about checking off a list of beliefs. Christianity is about living out these beliefs, putting them into action, imitating Christ. That's what it takes to be a good witness for Christ, is being able to love as Christ loves, being able to forgive as Christ forgives, taking care of people as Christ takes care of, going to those in need as Christ did, sacrificing one's own desires to help others. That is what demonstrates to this world what Christ is all about. Let's go back to this idea of a courtroom. Picture in your head again. The lawyer calls out the witness. The witness comes up, gives a testimony. First lawyer sits down. Now it's the other lawyer's turn. And what this other lawyer, the, the opposing lawyer, wants to do is refute that testimony. And the best way to refute that testimony is to discredit the witness. And so that other lawyer will begin a line of questioning and argument that is looking to find the faults in this person. The things that are wrong in their story, but more than that, the things that are wrong in their life. This person's not the expert, as they say. This person doesn't remember as clearly as they say they do. They try to find those, those faults in the life and prove that this person is not reliable. They're, they're coming in with some sort of bias or some sort of prejudice or something that's, that's discoloring this testimony. That's what the world does to us. We stand as Christians and we use words to talk about Jesus, to tell the stories of Jesus. But the world is not only listening to our words. In fact, most of the time, they're not listening to our world, words. The world is looking to our lives. And they're looking for cracks. They're looking for faults. Their question is, do our lives, our behaviors, our actions, our prejudices and biases, our demands, our attitudes, our conduct, do the way that we live our lives discredit our testimony? Are we, in fact, reliable witnesses for Christ? I'm afraid that often we are not. We are proclaimers of the good news of Jesus Christ, but too often our lives do not reflect the good news. Too often it is not good news when we should not. We're also going through these hymns during Lent, and our hymn this week is We've a Story to Tell to the Nation. It's a familiar hymn to a lot of us. It's a popular hymn that's been around for well over 100 years. Written by English hymn writer H. Ernest Nickel in 1896. This hymn is actually part of what's described as the great missions movement of the late 19th, early 20th century. During this time in Christian history, especially Western Christian history, that ordinary Christians, primarily in America and England, but also spread out throughout Europe, ordinary Christians started to become passionate about foreign mission work, especially in places like Africa and Asia. And this missionary movement, it, it grew out of pastors and hymn writers and evangelists and revival speakers that will go around describing the needs that were out there and how we as Christians can't just sit in here on our backsides, but we actually have to go out there and do the work of Christ. And this movement grew 
Ordinary men and women, folks like y'all right here, began to take the idea of ministry out of the hands of people like me who get paid to do it and said, no, 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 we, we need to be the ones doing this. And they did. It was this great, huge movement. Changed the world. Christians went all, all over the place telling the stories of Jesus and doing the good works that Christ sent them to do. And our hymn this morning reflects that, that passion and that belief that we do have a story to tell to the nations, that the whole world needs to hear about Jesus. This hymn reflects that passionate belief that our story, the story of Jesus, can change the world from a place of darkness into a place of light. This hymn reassures us that Christ's great kingdom can come on earth. This hymn serves as a declaration and a reminder that what we are proclaiming is truth and peace and an end to evil. That's a good hymn. It's a good hymn. It's catchy. It's easy to sing. It's really, really easy. It's really easy to use these words to make this declaration. But do our lives credit or discredit this story? Getting back to today's scripture, the author of Hebrews brings to our minds this cloud of witnesses, those whose faith sets an example for us to follow. But then he admonishes us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. See, it's not enough just to be surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We ourselves are to be a great cloud of witnesses. We are to live the sort of lives that change the world for the better. Let me make sure I include that. Change the world for the better. But the author doesn't end there either. He tells us that we're supposed to live this sort of life, and then he goes on. God is treating you as children. For what child is there from a parent is not this? We talked about this one here a few weeks ago. We looked at the idea that this one is not just punishment for wrongdoing. This one is how you shape a life to be the kind of person that they're supposed to be. And we like to talk about this one when it comes to children. We believe that all children should be disciplined. They should be taught what is right, what is wrong, what you should do, what you should not do, this is how you act, this is how you behave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We love discipline for children. But we're not children. We grew up a while back. We don't need discipline anymore. At least that's what we tell ourselves. We're beyond that. We have matured beyond that. And yet here is scriptures telling us God is treating you like children. We do need discipline. We will never outgrow the discipline of Christ. Because discipline is how you shape your life. And even if you say, I have no discipline, you do. You're just disciplined for the wrong things. We need discipline, not that we need to be punished constantly. And we need that correction. We need that guidance. We need God saying, this is good to do. This is not good to do. Then we need to follow through. We don't want to discipline ourselves because then we're no longer the ones in charge and we might be the ones in charge. And our author of Hebrews knew that, so he writes, if you do not have that discipline which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not God's children. Imagine that. We're not submitting ourselves to Christ's discipline, then that means that we're not really being God's children. We're illegitimate. If we have taken upon ourselves the name of Christian, then we must accept the discipline of being a Christian. We must walk in obedience to God. We must live lives that are free of evil, lives that are full of love and mercy and truth and justice and compassion and healing and hope. 
We must live lives as Christ lived. And our witness must match this story that we tell. Now, once again, today we come to Christ's people. But as we do so, I want to admonish you not to come forward glibly or unthinkingly. Don't come forward out of just responsive habit. Rather, consider our own lives, each of us. Consider the type of witness that we are in the world. And let us come to this table as children, confessing our wrongdoing and submitting ourselves to the discipline of the Lord, prepared to learn from our Father the right way to live so we can truly be called his children. Then, and only then, the story we tell to the nations, the way that we live out our daily lives, will become a story that turns darkness to light. Holy God, we want to be in charge of our own lives, and yet we are called to submit ourselves to you. Help us to do that now, to learn from you, and to live the lives that you have intended us to live. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. As you will turn in your hand to number 12. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess that we have not loved enough you with our whole heart. We have failed to be the of each We have not been with you. We have not We have not been with you. We have not been with you. We have not all the money in the papers, and we have not heard about the money. Forgive us, we pray. Free us to the joy of obedience to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we are yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father only, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, in heaven and earth are full of your glory. For the and the night, for us to see the crowns of the anchor, for the and the night. Holy are you and blessed are your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new country. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his son, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you need, in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his son, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant pour out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves a praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offered for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, God, and hear it on his gifts of bread and wine. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, 
one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and defeats his heavenly victory. Your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ was broken for you. And the blood of Christ is shed for you. Our Lord's table is made ready. The invitation is given. This invitation is for all. You be a member here or anywhere to have baptized. But simply be willing to open your hands to receive these elements of communion, to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ for yourself. We'll do this beginning on this side of the church. We're going to wait from front to back. And then this side, you'll come forward. You will gather around the altar rail. You may stand. You may kneel however you're comfortable. You'll be given a piece of the bread. You'll be offered the cup. All is made ready. Come. As you have received from Christ at his table, go forth telling his story and living a life that supports that story through your own hands. Amen. Amen.
his table. Go forth telling his story to others and living a life that supports his story with your own. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Let us prepare ourselves for the week that lies ahead by turning our hymnals to number 569. We have a story to tell to the nations. You may stand as you are comfortable. Number 569. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 